Hi, so I'm Eric. Um, we're going to start off um, with a quick poll. Um, and I need my notes, so I'll hold on for just a moment, sorry. Is there anybody here who is not uh, using Puppet currently, has never used Puppet before? Folks back here, one upstairs. Can we give them a round of applause? Welcome and thank you. And Don and Kara are also going to give you uh, the latest edition of the Pro Puppet book, which just came out um, about a month ago, so you can get started. Sorry, one more. There we go. So, how many people are using Puppet now? Hopefully that's everybody else. There's only two options. Um, keep, uh, keep, raise your hands, keep them up. Keep your hand up if you've been using Puppet for more than a year. So that's about 25% that went down. More than two years. So over 50% that went down. Over three years. Uh, we're running, running low. So uh, of those of you that's still at three years, uh, keep your hand up if you have, um, it, if you're interested in writing uh, types and providers in Ruby. <laughs> we have uh, another book for those of you with your hands still up. Yeah. Uh, this is the Public Types and Providers book that Dan Bodie and Dan Blue wrote, and it's a great um, getting started guide for doing some more advanced extensions to Puppet. <laughs> of, of those people with your, uh, with your old school hands still up, does anyone remember what Puppet's name was before it was Puppet? It's in the Git log, you can find it. Down back, back at the very beginning, Puppet was actually called Blink. Um, okay, and and one, more, one more set of polls. How many of you are currently on the 2.x series of Puppet? And how many on 3.x? That's what I'd like to see. Uh, anyone in pre-2.6, still running pre-2.6? Old school. Uh, excellent. It, oh, and, and one more set of polls. How many of you are currently using Puppet Enterprise? Great. That's, that's awesome. Thank you for uh, allowing this to happen. So I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about why we're here. Not necessarily here on the planet, but here in this room and here uh, talking about Puppet and talking about infrastructure and automation more generally. There's an ancient Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. It's both a blessing and a curse because there's lots of things happening, but there's lots of things happening. Uh, and we certainly live in one of those interesting times. There's more services, more servers, and all of that is becoming more critical. Uh, every every day that goes by. There's no future that we can think of in which uh, we have fewer servers that we have to manage, or fewer services we have to manage, or that those become less critical to the business. Do you remember when you could take your servers down for the weekend? Do you remember when your rollback plan involved, well, if it gets to Saturday night and the migration is not done, we can always plug in the old disk arrays. Does anybody still live in that world? <laughs> I, I feel for you, I do not envy you. Uh, no, for most of us, it's all about doing more, doing it faster, uh, repeatability, automation of the keys. Uh, the days when you would order a server and it would take nine months to show up and to get into production and it's those days are gone nine months is way too long three months is way too long three weeks is often too long the old practices around everything from provisioning to uh, artisanally hand tooling your server configuration uh, are, are constraints that slow down 
the speed with which we can deliver value to the business. You can't hire one system then for 25 servers anymore. You would end up with an army, all of you, just to run one service, and that obviously it's not going to scale. You also can't decide to stay the same and not to change because if you do that and your competitors change, you've just lost. So the practices are old, old practices are constraints on velocity, and a lot of those are going away due to fundamental shifts in the way IT works today. Now you can launch a thousand machines in 20 seconds. Uh, workloads can shift, they can scale up, scale down in minutes, not days, not weeks, not months. A lot of the developers that are pushing out the application code have uh, adopted agile methodologies and the code that gets delivered and needs to get out to production comes you know, not on a six month cycle, not on a three month cycle, not even on a six week cycle, but in many of the fastest moving operations, we see it happen every day, multiple times a day. If you listen to uh, John Allspot talk about how things work at Etsy, they're, they're in the dozens of, of pushes out to production a day. There are a few movements that are behind this that are all sort of working in our favor because we're here and we're aware of the changes that are taking place and we want to use them to our advantage and not be overtaken by them and lose out to somebody who is aware of them. The first one, which we talk about a lot, is, is the DevOps movement, um, which has a lot of hype around it. Yes, it has a lot of um, mis characterizations. For me, what DevOps is about comes back to uh, the four <coughs> principles that John Willis and David Edwards talk about. It's about culture, it's about automation, it's about measuring everything, and it's about sharing. And the sharing means not only sharing the code, and, but sharing the practices, share what you've learned, share what went wrong and what went right, and a lot of that is what we're about here today, is to learn from each other's experience and uh, learn how, how, how are some of the most uh, advanced organizations out there making DevOps work for them. Another movement is, uh, is cloud, obviously. Also another term that is overloaded that means everything from uh, a NAS device that you attach to your Xbox somehow. I saw an ad for that last week and it really confused me that that was a cloud, but apparently that's the case all the way out to uh, what, we what sane thinking people think of as the cloud, that is Amazon and public services that allow you to get rid of your own hardware, let someone else run the hardware, and you just manage the operating systems on it. And I think the third major movement that's, that's kind of riding on the tops of both of those is this transition to web operation style apps for almost everything. <coughs> Turns out that distributed systems are really hard but the future is itself distributed and our applications, our IT applications, need to, need to match. They said there's no future, not in a sex pistol sense, but no future in which there are fewer servers or fewer services or that things are getting radically simpler. In fact, things are getting radically more complex. But what we see is the software as a service companies are really setting the trend for how to manage this. So um, a, a, a great example of this is running email services. Um, how many of you run uh, your email servers for your organization? And conversely, how many of you have outsourced your email and use a third party provider? So it's about half and half, and I would imagine that even, even a decade ago, it would have been way skewed towards running your own mail servers. I mean, I, uh, I think the last time that I configured a Sendmail CF was about a decade ago. The last time I configured a Postfix config was much more recently than that because I kind of left Sendmail behind with the, the tortures of the 90s. But um, now I don't run any email. I, I don't run email. Google runs the email, and uh, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Keeping the spam assassin filters up to date, all that kind of stuff, is just not what I'm particularly good at. It's not something that I enjoy doing, and so I'd much rather have somebody else do that. But that's, that's the idea. These, the, these software as a service companies will take something that used to be a purely on-premise 
type of uh, operation that was not necessarily core to IT or core to the business, but it's just kind of something that you had to have, calendar and email, that sort of thing, and uh, make it so that it runs someplace else. Now again, that doesn't mean that there are fewer servers. Your servers have just moved to somebody else's business, but you get to consume that as a service, and it turns out that uh, a lot of different areas that are not, are not core to what our organization do are gonna follow the same model. But despite that, you know, enter enterprise still pays the bills. There are thousands of apps that people have developed in-house, and most of what we find that people do with Puppet is to you know, start out at some point earlier on in the, in the configuration of the stack and then move towards managing their in-house IT operations, their applications, uh, because there's such massive heterogeneity. There's so, such a variety of applications that people run, and everybody's application seems to be, you know, they certainly have some common elements, but there's almost always something that is you know, unique and special to them, and the idea is to uh, make those processes as repeatable and automated as possible. So that's where Puppet comes in. We're absolutely dedicated to driving down the cost of technological change. We want to make it super easy to push change out across your enterprise, super easy to get uh, new versions of your applications, new applications, new servers, new configurations pushed out uh, with as, as low friction as possible. I'm going to dive into a little bit of uh, history about Puppet, kind of a little, for, for some of the new folks, uh, um, talk a little bit about how it works under the hood. Puppet is not uh, a new idea. It started a long time ago, out of uh, about eight and a half years ago, out of a fear that uh, the tools were not going to get better. At the time, the state of the art um, was in automation, in configuration management automation with CF Engine. And while CF Engine is an awesome tool, it has a lot of had a lot of power behind it and a great model. Uh, there, there are some things that it didn't do well. And in fact, that was my first experience with configuration management was using CF Engine in the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, it, it, there, were, there was, at, a time, at the time, again, it was amazing that, that this existed at all and that we could do stuff like bring up new machines, have them from being plugged in and powered on to running an application in a matter of an hour or so uh, with no manual intervention. But there was a lot of things that it didn't do or didn't do well, and that led to the creation of, of Puppet. Puppet, again, a little bit of uh, trivia. Puppet originally uh, ran as a uh, plugin to CF Engine, so you could use Pub Puppet to gather more information about your system and inject that back into CF Engine through uh, its, its module mechanism. And then gradually, more and more of the functionality that CF Engine did uh, absorbed into Puppet. <coughs> But really, our lifeblood is in data center and cloud automation. It's primarily for servers. We primarily work on servers, but we're expanding out. And what we see is with the trend towards software-defined networking, software-defined storage, that more things are becoming puppetable. And uh, there's a lot of new types of hardware, new types of devices, and really new frontiers, again, in, in the, this world of collaborative automation um, that the puppets, the puppet can take advantage of pretty, pretty easily. There are some sites that use Puppet for managing laptops and workstations. Particularly in recent months, we've made great strides in uh, support for Windows and added some stuff for really sophisticated Windows NT uh, ACL support. But primarily, we're, we're focused on data center cloud automation. How does it work under the hood? This is a uh, little snippet of Puppet code kind of the canonical example in the, in, of using Puppet to do something simple, but again, incredibly powerful. What we see in here is not just the syntax, which looks, well, even though our arrows aren't aligned, let's look at that. Um, uh, with the, the syntax looks very much like a configuration file, and it should be easily sort of understandable if you've ever configured Nagios or Apache or something like that. But when it interpreted and run through the Puppet, Puppet agent will build a model of the resources which are described here, the package, the file, and the service, and then describe the connections between them that we put, like a notify, 
uh, from the file onto the service, so the file changes the service will know that it needs to be restarted. And the same thing for the require line and the, on the service. There's no sense in trying to manage a service if the prerequisites aren't met, if the packed installation either hasn't happened yet or has failed, or and, and the configuration files are there. It might in fact be dangerous to start at the service before the site-specific configuration is laid down. Puppet lets you model those dependencies and execute them in a really simple way. And it does this through this, this the cycle of defining the configure, defining what you want your infrastructure to look like. Running simulation, another great uh, advantage of Puppet is that the model allows you to run in, in no-op mode, which will run through your configuration as you've defined it, but not actually make any changes on the systems. So it becomes super easy to tell if you have a typo in your configuration or if you haven't expressed dependencies correctly and before you actually push it out to production. So this is pretty, uh, pretty huge and something that's not possible uh, before before Puppet came along. If when you when you've got the configuration dialed in, you can flip over to enforce mode, and anything that's out of line on the system, the Puppet detects is not in uh, the way it's supposed to be. Puppet will remediate that and bring it back into the desired state, and then send back a report to the central uh, console ser server. And there's lots of plugins and sensibility that's available at all these points, but the main the main point here is that there's, it's a continuous cycle, and it's, you're never done. Public configuration is never you know, something that you bun, bundle up and uh, put under lock and key. It's a continuously evolving thing, and, and because the needs of the business change, so there's new applications that get rolled out. Even if your personal application doesn't change, I guarantee you there are things going on in your distribution that you want to be aware of and push out as quickly as possible. Open SSH vulnerabilities, Ruby vulnerabilities that are a result of open SSH vulnerabilities, that sort of thing. So I had that on my mind a lot recently because there's been some fairly brutal stuff that's come out in, in the last couple of weeks about, um, about Ruby. I'll talk about that in a minute. And this sort of, this shows that cycle in a similar, uh, a little different visualization and uh, starts to break down into some of the component pieces here. We have uh, a program called Factor that you can run on its own. It's uh, uh, basically a system inventory system. Gather all of the relevant bits of data about your machines, send them back up to the central server. So the server figures out based on the facts and based on your, your in-house code and the modules that you've downloaded from the forge, what the catalog ought to be over in step two. Delivers that back to the node and where the node then applies it in that chat. <coughs> What do, I, what do I look like now? What am I supposed to be looking like? And, and enforce any, uh, any, any drift that's happened, remediating drift that's happened. And there's a reporting step to get that information back to the, back into the Puppet Master. One more kind of architecture side of the slide, and then we'll, we'll uh, talk about Puppet Enterprise a little bit. The, if I were to redo this slide today, uh, instead of uh, application servers and database servers, we would start adding storage servers and network devices in there too, but the model's the same and the principles are the same where all of these uh, devices either run an agent on them natively or run a proxy agent, which can talk to them in the case of San Cisco Switch, which can't run an um, uh, agent on it natively. They'll communicate back up to the server, uh, and, and this platform piece is, is something that I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, but th this, these are really the constituent pro projects that make up um, the Puppet ecosystem. We have a database storage server uh, called PuppetDB. We have the console dashboard that, that you can connect to and visually watch uh, what's going on across your infrastructure. And up at the top, Right there, uh, that's all of the reusable content that's contributed in open source um, by, by community developers. Uh, people have solved the problems that you may have, um, you, you may be accounting yourself, 
it said that there's no new problems in IT, that there's no, nothing that's new under the sun. Um, and that's almost certainly true if you're trying to configure an application stack. There's probably somebody out there who's run into the same problem as you and is trying to fix it uh, and has uploaded their, the results of their work to the forge. We talk a little bit about Puppet Enterprise, which is Puppet's commercial product. Puppet Enterprise is a solid platform for you to develop, uh, to, to deploy your infrastructure on. Um, it's got, it's a, no, I don't want that. I tried it and it fell off. It was a disaster. Um, so, as I mentioned, there's a lot of stuff that goes into Puppet. In Puppet Enterprise, there's about 45 different open source projects that we pull together, test for scalability, test for quality, test to make sure they, they work with one another. If you were to do this yourself, you certainly could. Uh, they're pretty much you know, things, a, a fairly standard web stack, Apache, Passenger, Ruby versions, uh, a bunch of, of uh, additional modules that Puppet needs to, to run correctly. But it's, it's, a fairly, it's a fairly involved stack. Again, there's about 45 different open source projects. Puppet Enterprise pulls them all together, package consistent versions for all of the operating systems that we support, and uh, to deliver that in an easy to install uh, method. There's a scripted installation which Steven's going to talk about later on this afternoon, and it's really easy to um, capture the configuration that you have on one machine and redeploy it across your whole fleet without, um, without having to do, again, without having to do manual configurations, kind of to defeat the purpose of an automation tool if you had to manually install it everywhere. Um, we have great support. We have a uh, place to turn for help getting started, or if you run into trouble, we have a support team that, that's uh, available via email or phone. Um, it, and additionally, there's some training services and documentation. You don't have to take all of that onto you and become the expert in every single op op piece of Puppet's operation. There's, the, the, the goal here is to reduce the risk of running your own your own setup. Um, there's there's certainly some organizations that uh, if you have a huge IT staff, you have tons of systems administrators that are already doing development, that are already comfortable with Puppet, um, and if you're out on the out on the bleeding edge of the open source world, um, I'm looking at you, Eric. Uh, that, that Eric, of course, at Spotify, he'll be, he'll be talking um, later on this afternoon, and uh, oh, no, wait, yes, uh, about. Uh, their Puppet workflow is at 3.15. And uh, they have done some fairly amazing things with Puppet and Spotify. Not a, not a traditional Puppet Enterprise customer. For uh, sites which have you know, a, t a longer adoption cycle, have uh, more risk aversion, Puppet Enterprise is a great fit because you can buy it and know that you'll have a long support lifetime. But we hear from the uh, our Enterprise customers is that they wish that we released more slowly in some cases. In fact, some people wish that we would not release anything except the one that they're running and the fix the bugs which they themselves reported. Can't do that, we have to, we have to move forward. We have, we're always gonna be deploying new features and putting out new releases. But um, there's, there's, there's this tension back, or back and forth in between a long support lifecycle, which you get above enterprise, and the being out on the bleeding edge of open source development in the FOSS world. In addition, it it would, it's great to have support and services, but um, as the Red Hat CEO, Jim Weinberg said, if, you, if all Red Hat did was sell services and support, they'd be this tiny little company that was just marginally profitable. And uh, the features are really what's driving the value of Puppet Enterprise and what we're trying to deliver is new kinds of functionality that m mostly focus around workflows. This is a screenshot from the new Event Inspector, which was released in Puppet Enterprise 3.1, and new, um, uh, yeah, so new workflows that'll help you, sorry, the jet lag is catching up to me this morning. Is it too early for a beer? 
So, event inspector, live management is another one that's got a great uh, uh, user interface over the orchestration engine. This is a way to get real-time inventory, real-time status across your whole infrastructure. It uses a uh, technology called M-Collective under the hood, and the live management UI is a public enterprise only uh, user interface that lets you control all aspects of, of the orchestration engine. These are things like, uh, not just to trigger um, deployments and execution of Puppet, but also get real-time inventory across the machines, and uh, you can check for you know, uh, drift across different um, types of resources that Puppet supports. Like in this case, we're, we're looking at the groups that are available across the systems that have checked in, and you can see that they're all um, in compliance with one another. If somebody had gone on and, say, changed the group ID manually on, on one of the machines that would show up here, and you could, you could you know, surface that difference really, really easily and uh, go in and write public code to remediate. And the last thing is kind of a uh, set of integrations around our, our commercial customers like VMware, or commercial partners like VMware, sorry. Uh, and the, the cloud provision around the VM, VMware integration is, a, is kind of the, the title, uh, the prime example of this. Um, on the FOSS side, and this is, uh, you know, my, the, my responsibility on the product manager for the platform, which is kind of that center line component, the stuff below the user interface. And we're trying to manage the flow of releases in between the stuff that gets released in open source and in, in, in kind of an upstream model into Puppet Enterprise. It seems like having the same code released on the same day is probably too soon. And we did a little bit of that with the Puppet Enterprise 3 release back in June, where there was uh, some, uh, it was a, a full stack refresh of Puppet Enterprise, which had sort of lagged behind where the open source world was. And, and there was some, some stuff that went into the release that saw, first saw the light of the day when Puppet Enterprise went out. That's probably too short of a uh, sync up. On the other hand, six to nine months for a feature to get from the open source world into public enterprise is probably way too long. We want to have a controlled flow of stuff that comes from the open source world because there's a lot of innovation going on. It's a, in a lot of ways, a technical proving ground for things which are going to uh, work out in, in a, a way that we're not necessarily certain of by the time it's ready for public enterprise. A good example of this is the work that Henrik Lindbergh's been doing on the uh, future parser. He completely rewrote one of the um, deepest and oldest parts of the Puppet, Puppet code, the part that parses the manifests and modules that are written. And uh, there's a lot of code out there. We didn't want to break people's uh, existing infrastructure but we had to move forward. We had to figure out a way to innovate and, and to get the fa get faster, more expressive syntax, better error reporting, and new functionality like uh, loops and lambdas, which have long been lacking in the code language. So that hit an open source first, but was an optional, an opt-in kind of feature. So for the three, most of the three .x series, it's been available as dash dash parts for the future and you can play around with it and, and see how it works on your, your body of code, report bugs on it, that sort of stuff. It's available in public enterprise, but it's not going to be made the default until uh, we're, we're sure that we've got all the, all the bugs nailed down for it. So we need, we need room to make mistakes, to try out things. One, another example of this is the iteration syntax that came in there, where uh, one of the main complaints is people started writing more advanced public code was so they needed an easier way to do loops inside the language. And the early three dot, the early version of Future Parser actually had three or four different syntaxes because they weren't sure which one was going to make the most sense to people. We put all of them in, did a bunch of user testing, and 
after survey, after doing really intense test pilot testing, which I'll talk about a little bit later, it, we determined that the sit we got a clear winner. Uh, so in Pilot three four, we removed all except the the winning syntax, and that's what's going to become the default uh, in the future version of Puppet. So that's a great example of how innovation will happen in the open source side and then flow into Puppet Enterprise once it's really solid. But there are tons of components. There are the, the components that are make up the Puppet platform, which I'll dive into in a little more detail in a minute, are highly flexible. You can scale up to tens of thousands of servers if you need to with them. You're going to be try, uh, doing some unusual things out at that scale, but uh, that's that's why it's open source. That's why it's there. When you run into problems, you can you can fix it. You can file bugs. You can send send in a report, and we'll um, we'll do what do what needs to be done because that sort of scale is super important for the future. Things that open source customers are doing today are the you know feel like they're very bleeding edge, but those are the things that everybody's going to be doing two or three years down the road. <coughs> so what are those components? Obviously, first first off, I'm going to talk about Puppet a little bit. It's obviously the namesake of the company and, and uh, their bread and butter what we're doing. This is the engine that I talked about in the, in the circle diagram earlier around testing, uh, building a catalog, testing the current state, applying the catalog, and reporting back there. Um, and the Puppet Forge is a huge part of that. Puppet Forge is our open source community site, as I mentioned. And the content there is all lar is largely written in using the Puppet language itself. There are uh, there are Ruby extension points that you can download and use, but for the most part, uh, the modules on the Forge are written in Puppet and use Puppet to, to do their work. I mentioned M Collective when I talked about live management a minute ago. Uh, M Collective, or Marion Collective is his full name. This is this parallel real-time execution engine. Uh, it uses ActiveMQ under the hood and uh, can talk to thousands of servers in really rapid order. You can do distributed commands. People are doing very really sophisticated deployment pipelines using M Collective, where uh, using some of the features that are in the, la the current shipping version, you can do a Progressive deployment and only take, say, send a command out, but only take 10% of your machines out at a time. So if you want to do a rolling upstart, a rolling restart across your whole fleet, you can make sure that you don't ever drop below uh, a level of number of services running in order to provide continue to provide service, but eventually roll through all, your whole fleet over time. PubDB uh, is, as I mentioned, the data storage engine that's, that backs Puppet. It's uh, based on, uh, it uses Postgres as the database, uh, and is it, but the PubDB code itself is a, um, a closure application, and it uh, is incredibly fast and hugely scalable. We store the, all the facts that each of the nodes report in, as well as all the catalogs and reports, and um, is the foundation for all of their reporting and analysis. The event inspector, which I mentioned, uses Puppet, uses the open Puppet DB APIs in order to build this really awesome uh, workflow or GUI on top of on, on top of the data that it collects across your infrastructure, so that you can find out not just <clears throat> whether a change happened, but why it why it happened. And as I mentioned, Factor is, is, a, is the inventory tool which drives that information. Um, Factor runs at the beginning of every pub run, and uh, the default set of facts that it knows about the system are, is huge. On a uh, stock Ubuntu system, you'll get back about 50 or 60 facts, and there's tons of additional plugins on the Forge which extend that to um, you know, e easily up to 100, 100 or so little bits of data about your machine. Um, which are then queryable, they're storable, and you can use them to drive decision making inside your public. <coughs> so Factor is a really important part of it. We're, um, Factor right now is in uh, the, the, the final stages of uh, development for Factor 2.0, which has been a long time in coming. Um, but then I think we talked about it in Gens last year, 
in one of the breakout sessions at Public Pub Camp again, and uh, the, the main headline feature for it is that you can now have um, deeply nested data structures for your facts. So the developer's working hard on making it so that you not, don't just get a flat list of the, um, the facts, but they can actually contribute new hash keys to the, to the data. You can, uh, instead of having a separate fact for every network interface, for instance, you can have a, a deeply nested hash which contains the interface information in it. So that's, that's in the, I don't know that we've, we have an RC yet, but that should be out in the next couple of weeks, and that's pretty awesome in dance and you know, world of factor. Hira uh, is another component. It's a uh, data code separation. Can I do a quick poll here too? How many of you are using Hira in your environments today? Wow, oh, it's a lot of Hira folks. Um, are, is anybody using a non-YAML or JSON backends for it? Oh, cool. What, what are you using? Elbow. What is it? Elbow. Elbow. Yeah, we are now Elbow. Oh, Elbow. Yeah. How about your? One more. Pub, use a Pub DB backend for Hira. Okay, you I want to talk to because that's great. It's <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Right, so again, it's really extensible. It, it, Hira is a way to separate out your data from inside your Pub manifest and to put site-specific data in, inside a data, data store. Um, and again, massively pluggable. It's uh, people are using it to do things that uh, I don't. I don't know that it's creator. And certainly, I could not have anticipated when when it first came out. So, uh, yeah. And our provisioning, the provisioning side, we have. Um, uh, is anybody using Razor? A similar, similar poll. A couple of people. So they're using the new new one. We, we have a, um, so Razor was a technology that we got from EMC and VMware a couple of years ago. And uh, it was a, it's a really awesome uh, provisioning tool that uses this rules engine to determine how your machines ought to be installed. And, and gets them up to the point from being either bare metal or um, image-based provisioning for, for cloud services. And gets them up to the point where Puppet can run. Um, it, the, the original code dump had, so it was more a proof of concept than it was production shipping code. Uh, so uh, David Lericourt and uh, Daniel Pittman led, it, led an effort to uh, re-implement it. And uh, it'll be integrated into the next version of Puppet Enterprise v 3.2, which will be out in a couple of months as a technology preview. Um, but it's a great, uh, great tool and a great way to take control of your infrastructure with Puppet. All the information that it finds out about your systems also gets fed into PubDB. So PubDB has awareness of your machines before they even come up on the network. <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, uh, so we have a, this is a, another part of the open source process is actually getting the contributions in. Um, I have a little bit of guilt when I see this slide because I have not given the armatures the attention that they deserve. Um, it's a basically a process that's based on the Python enhancement proposals and Java enhancement proposals for people who want to make substantial changes to Puppet itself. And um, we started out with a uh, repository on GitHub where the um, documents resided and could be modified with pull requests and that sort of stuff. People found it really hard to comment and to participate in the workflow, so um, I'm trying to move that over to just a document-based workflow, like using Google Docs, and um, hope to work on that in the next week while I have a little time on here and, and other people that are interested in, in armatures. Um, there have been some great successes though that have come out of it. I think the probably the, the biggest example in, in the past few months has been the Windows um, ACL support that I mentioned earlier, which was uh, a great collaborative process from the community. It had, I think, about a 75 or 80 message long thread on the mailing list that did not devolve into a flame war and did not devolve into a bike shed. It was, it was, it was unbelievable. It was really productive and came up with a great design that's incorporated into the armature. 
and the Puppet Forge, which I mentioned a couple of times, but I can't hammer this point home enough. Um, if you have a problem, there's probably a solution on the Puppet Forge. It may not be exactly what you need. You may have to download it and tweak it, but it's almost always enough to get you started and save you anywhere from you know an hour to a week or a month's worth of work. As they say, um, a, a month worth of coding can easily save you an hour on Google. And that's certainly true of the Puppet Forge, too. Um, and it's really easy. It's built integrated into the Puppet to up to deploy, um, I'm sorry, to package and upload your own modules, too. I guess this is a slide of us. I'm not, I actually don't, I'm not I'm sure why this is. So, we have coffee. <laughs> We have beer, and we like to eat, and we like food. We're people. <laughs> um, I do like this slide though, because this shows our uh, some of our customer list, and it's neat because it's not just one segment or one sector of, of business that finds Puppet useful. There's all kinds of companies across a wide range of industries that are using Puppet today to help drive the cost of their change down and to increase their uh, velocity and get um, better control of their IT infrastructure. You might recognize a couple of these, I don't know. So our company has grown hugely. When I started um, a year and a half ago, I think I was the 75th employee or something like that, and we're at over 240 now. We continue to hire at a at an incredible pace. Most of these jobs are in Portland, Oregon, which is very much like Amsterdam, except it's maybe four degrees warmer there, but it's pretty much the same. Um, and uh, but, but our development um, team is, is pretty distributed, and so if you're interested in one of those positions, uh, check out our, our website. And Finally, I wanted to give a little call to action at the end here to say, if you're not already involved, and I know a lot of people are, but there's a lot of opportunities to get involved with the community. I mean, obviously starting here at, in public camp is a great, great way, but we have many avenues for not only um, answering your technical questions, but also connecting with other people. Maybe, maybe again, saving yourself some time, learning from somebody else's mistakes, and, um, ultimately helping the helping make other systems lives easier. We have a fairly new certification program and training program um, and uh, there's they're blocked out. I'm not sure um, how prevalent this is, but their certifications are actually are, I mean here in Europe, but the certifications are actually starting to show up in job postings, which is a pretty awesome thing because it's kind of a mark that you've you know, cared enough to get training and uh, have a baseline level of competence in using Puppet, which has pretty much become the de facto uh, systems administration automation tool out there. So the courses and the certification when you're done with the courses are a great way to do that. Here's some pull quotes about the training, which I believe that we're in one of the right areas up there. So, um, and yeah, we, we definitely have uh, a lot of um, success. There's a lot of people that have gone through it. I think we trained more people in the last year than we had in the previous, or in the last six months of last year than we had in all time before that. So it's definitely ranking up. And if you can't get to an online class, you can do, the, do it online. If you can't get to an in-person class, you can do it online as well. And uh, there's some awesome new um, uh, videos and uh, tutorial courses that are up on our new learning management system. It kind of tracks your progress as you go through the system. It's a really great resource. I mentioned a couple of times about the um, test pilot about our UX research program. Uh, this is a great way to help influence how the products come out and what happens with it. As I said, when we weren't sure about what the right iterations and decks were, we turned through our network of test pilots and found people that were interested in the problem that had uh, hacked something together in their own site and used the, you, you know, use them as the pe as the examples for, um, for for what the right thing to do was. We're pretty much always running some kind of UX research 
and it's a it's a great program. It's a great way to get uh, your opinions heard. If, if you if there's things in Puppet that you absolutely hate or you absolutely love, uh, this is a great way to get that feedback back. And and the, again, there's almost always some Amazon gift cards involved. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that we're having our, our public conf uh, in September. It seems like a long ways away, but uh, it'll come up really quickly. It's in San Francisco um, again this year. It's a great uh, opportunity to talk to people from all over the world who are interested in Puppet. And it's not just a public conference. We have lots of other um, talks, lots of other tracks. And uh, the prices to register will never be cheaper than they are right now. So if you want to plan, plan ahead, you can um, go up and sign up online and get one. And that's all. Thank you so much for coming out today. I think there's going to be a great day of talks and a great uh, uh, amount of interaction with each other. So thanks for being part of it. Thank you. I, have, I have a couple minutes for questions, I think two. So if, any, if there's a burning question about it. So, yeah. Just a you know, general question. I've been mostly ignoring the So the question for, for everybody was, um, I, I contradicted myself in that I said that you can build your own web and enterprise like stack, um, but, that, that, but then I said that there are, there are PE-only features. Um, they're both true. So all of the platform components for Puppet Open Source, or for Puppet Enterprise <coughs> Open Source, so all of the pieces that are, the, the, that list of projects that I ran through are all, are all open source. There are, there are value, there are things in Hub Enterprise, mostly from a UI standpoint, but also the uh, VMware Cloud Provisioner plugin and a couple of other proprietary uh, components that we don't ship in open source projects. But the platform pieces itself, a Ruby stack, a web stack, the Puppet Master, PubDB, et cetera, you could build up your, yourself from components. And of the things which are Puppet Enterprise only, it's primarily uh, the, as I said, UI, components in the UI, um, and uh, the VMR cloud provisioner. I can't think of any other examples off the top of my head. I think that was it. Thanks. One more yeah. Uh, so the question was whether the VMware modules specifically will are, are going to be back into the, the open source back to Puppet Forge. Uh, so most of those are written. There are, there are a lot of third party um, integrators like VMware and like Cisco who are doing things with Puppet modules, and I think there's going to be a variety of avenues that they're going to use to get those out. Some of them are going to be commercial only, and some of them they will cite open source, but we don't really have a huge amount of influence over that. Depends on who owns the name, who owns the, the module itself and what they choose to do with it. I think that, so the, the specific VMware integration that I mentioned a minute ago is a, uh, will probably remain uh, commercial only, and that's a, a plug-in for cloud provisioners so that you can talk directly to vCenter and uh, vSphere and bring up new VMware instances um, through the public command line, and that's probably going to stay PE only. That's it for time. Thanks very much.